Hey, I'm Steve, also known as Terramantis, and this is my channel, Vicha. In this video, we're going to take a look at 10 things that you may or may not know about Bloodborne. We'll brush over topics based in lore, game mechanics, and things that are just simply fun to know. But all these Bloodborne topics are either obscure or widely unknown. Remember to play the game where if you learn something new, you hit the like button. But if you already knew everything, don't feel bad for one second to also hit the like button. The topics will get more difficult as we go, so let's get started. Alright, for number 10, did you know that the doll in the hunter's dream will react to specific emotes? Most cause her to tilt her head in confusion, but some emotes have interesting and unique responses. Now speaking of emotes, for the next one, did you know that unlike the Soul series before, in Bloodborne you're able to attach an emote to a message? This is great for direction giving and, you know, it further expands on detailed helpful hints or griefing people, which is always for the better. Alright, for the next one, did you know that there's a special music box that can temporarily stun Father Gascoigne? Yes, if you walk up to this window and speak to the children inside, you'll learn that their father is a hunter and he has gone out for the nightly hunt. Their mother went in search of their father as well, but she has forgotten her music box. The children go on to say that the music box plays one of their father's favorite songs. And when inspecting the music box's description, you'll notice that it's inscribed with the name Gascoigne. Now when confronting Father Gascoigne, he is obviously affected by the Plague of the Beast and is changing, but despite his primal transformation, the music box still will have an effect on him as it plays one of his favorite songs and reminds him of his family. It plays one of Daddy's favorite songs. TURN DOWN FOR WHAT?! <laughs> Messengers, these little guys have many jobs, but I'm willing to bet there's one or two that you may not know. One thing that you may not have noticed is as you're progressing through the game and acquiring hunter's badges, there will be more messengers in the birdbath and they're holding additional items associated with the badges you've collected. On a more interesting note, you may have noticed a ton of these little dudes around lanterns at times. Well, what you may not know is that the number of messengers around a specific lantern is undoubtedly related to multiplayer in some way. If you're playing offline, there will never be more than your four unique messengers, but when you're playing online, there can be many. This seems to suggest that the messengers around a lantern are representative of other players in your area and, more than likely, also within your level and summoning range. I'm sure it's not a one-to-one -one ratio, but when there's a bunch of these little creepy guys around a lantern, it seems as though invading and summoning happens more frequently and without a delay. Alright, for the next one we're going to take a look at one of the most underrated spells in the game, the Beast Roar. Sure, the actual spell itself doesn't do any damage, but with a little ingenuity it can be extremely powerful. And one of the coolest things that you may not know about the Beast Roar is that it can deflect all sorts of harmful projectiles. Spells, boulders, bullets... Yeah. Yeah, this thing is awesome. Also, in combination with the Beast Claws, the Beast Roar is even more powerful. This is because most enemies that can be staggered can be killed without even ever getting a chance to fight back. You see, when combining Beast Claws with Beast Roar, you're able to continuously stun lock an enemy until your stamina bar is completely depleted. But just as your bar is about to diminish, you simply perform the Beast Roar which will knock your enemy on their back. The knockdown's duration is enough to get a large chunk of your stamina back to repeat the process all over again. And that's exactly why Beast Mode is badass. In Dark Souls, you are able to break free from enemy grab attacks by quickly alternating the weak attack from your left and right hand. While in Bloodborne, you are able to do the same thing, but for whatever reason, the escape has changed a bit. Instead of hitting L1 and R1, now you can pretty much press anything. And depending on the speed of the button presses, you can break out of specific grabs at varying intervals. As you can see here, by pressing nothing during the grab, 5 ticks of damage are inflicted. But when either spamming buttons or rapidly pressing a singular button, you're able to break out of a grab much earlier. 
Now this doesn't work for every enemy, but I have found that it works for a good amount of grabs and it's definitely useful in a few boss fights as well. The next one is a cool little secret that's easy to miss. In order to find this, you have to make your way to Odin Temple. After the temple, you have to work your way down to Old Yarnum and defeat the blood-starved beast. Defeating the blood-starved beast will open a door in Odin Temple that was previously closed. Now after proceeding through the door and working your way into the silo shaped building you'll find a wooden platform off to the side are hanging ropes. Walking toward the ropes and falling from platform to platform will lead you to yet another door. And behind that door is the hunter's workshop, the real world basis for the hunter's dream. Here you can find the same building, the same gravestone, and even the doll. Now I have no doubt that there's many Demon Souls references in Bloodborne, but for number 3 I'm going to go over a few that I found so far. First off, in the alpha testing of Bloodborne, the Cleric Beast was supposed to be the only boss encounter, but some players were able to exploit the terrain to encounter a boss we now know as Father Gascoigne. If Gascoigne killed the player, he would say Umbasa, a famous line from Demon Souls. This quote was removed from the final game, but it's proof that even in the early stages of Bloodborne, the game intended to have nods to Demon Souls. Mbasa. Now also like Demon Souls, the boss of Cainhurst Castle, Martyr Lagarius, seems to be wielding a sword extremely reminiscent of one of the variations of Soulbrand, a very important weapon to the mythos of Demon Souls. Finally, you can also find a very out of place suit of plate armor in Bloodborne. This armor can be found in Chalice Dungeons as seemingly nothing more than environmental decoration. The reason this armor is significant though is because it's the iconic fluted armor of Demon Souls. Not only that, but its positioning is posed almost identical to Demon Souls box art. For number two, we're going to take a look at one of the more unique effects of Insight. As it's described in the reviewer's instruction manual, your insight level indicates the depth of inhuman knowledge the player has attained. As the level goes up, the player starts seeing things such as dolls starting to talk, new enemies appearing where they hadn't before, enemies' attack patterns changing, and so on. It's clearly obvious that insight is a very important part to Bloodborne, but what you may not know is that if you have 40 insight you're able to see the amygdalas in Yarnum. This can be done even before the events leading to the Blood Moon when the creatures are made permanently visible after defeating Rom the Vacuous Spider. The amount of insight you have obtained seems to indicate how closely connected you are to the Great Ones and the beings of other planes. Now this is important to number one because the topic is all about insight and why so many characters seem to be blind. So first off, have you ever wondered why so many of the characters seem to be blind? Father Gascoigne has bandages over his eyes. So does Amelia. The Odin Dweller says that they didn't know you were there because the incense must have masked your scent. Very sorry. The incense must have masked your scent. Clearly indicating that your character was unseen. And Willem, too, unlike the makeshift bandages of Gascoigne and Amelia, has a headdress covering his eyes, indicating long-term sightlessness since his clothing is tailored for it. Also, the eye rune relates to Willem specifically by stating, Eyes symbolize the truth Master Willem sought in his research. This illusion by the limits of human intellect, Master Wilm looked to beings from a higher plane for guidance, and sought to line his brain with eyes in order to elevate his thoughts. Well, what you may not know is that to seek this enlightenment, this insight, or to simply stop the visions, it would seem as though these characters, as well as many others, are removing their own eyes. The item description for Bloodshot Eyeball reads, An exquisite eyeball removed quickly after death, or perhaps even before. It would seem the closer to Eldritch truth, the more likely a character is to remove their own eyes, or in many cases, perform a nucleation. A nucleation is the removal of the eye that leaves the eye muscles and remaining orbital contents intact, meaning the eyeball is still in the socket but the person is left blind. This is also made evident in the opening cinematic as indicated by the blood plague town person and the close up of their foggy eye. The eyeball spins while still in the socket, demonstrating that it's not connected to the muscles and nerves behind it. I mean, a nucleation is such a hit in Yarnum that even some enemies are so kind that they'll seek to remove your eyes for you. 
Additionally, another word for nucleation is otipism, which more specifically is a form of serious self-inflicted eye injury that's a rare form of severe self-harm that's usually resulted in mental illness involving acute psychosis. And psychosis is defined as an abnormal condition of the mind, and is a generic psychiatric term for a mental state often described as involving a loss of contact with reality. This all seems to go hand in hand with the item description of Madman's knowledge in The Gaining of Insight which states, Making contact with the Eldritch Wisdom is a blessing, for even if it drives one mad. Also, as the Madman set details, it would seem as though the insight of the Great Ones drove these warriors mad as well. So pursuing insight leads to insanity, and that madness leads to Oedipism. Furthermore, the word Oedipism is derived from Greek mythology regarding the man Oedipus, who gouged out his eyes in penance. It's also definitely not a coincidence that this word Oedipism is clearly the root word for Odin Temple in Bloodborne. The short of it is that eye removal is certainly a hidden theme in Bloodborne, and if you've ever wondered why so many characters seem to be blind, well, it's because if you saw this thing hanging off your temple, you might go mad too. What you may not know is that the Souls franchise has an overarching theme of life being cyclical and time repeating itself over and over across eons. I believe this to be true of Destiny as well. Simply put, Bloodborne, through metaphorical undertones of the narrative and one of the most atmospheric, twisted and terrifying worlds I've ever seen, creates an experience like never before. See beyond our mind's eye that there is a way a potential for humans to evolve beyond their natural limitations. 